Just use the right foot. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this is the site of the Burning Tree Mastodon 22,000 years ago. Actually, it's a slide I stole from Todd Folking, and sort of an idea I stole from Todd Folking, just to indicate that 22,000 years ago, the site of the Burning Tree Mastodon was covered with glacial ice, as was much of Ohio. This shows the glaciation patterns at the height of the, the, the glaciation. And here we are in central Ohio with glacial ice on top of us. from the National Geographic showing the diversity of fauna in North America during the Pleistocene, not Ohio specifically. There were no camels in Ohio, for, for example. But there were a lot of these animals, mammoths, mastodons, uh, giant short-faced bear, no American lions to speak of in Ohio. No saber-toothed tigers have been found in Ohio, but they have been found in adjacent states, so they were probably here. Um, but the next slide shows the drastic decline in biodiversity at the end of the Pleistocene. All the animals that became extinct at the end of the Pleistocene are whited out. <laughs> so we think we have this wonderfully diverse North American fauna, but it is a pale shadow of what was here during the Pleistocene period. Um, and one of the most fascinating questions for not only North American geologists, archaeologists, paleontologists, I mean, what happened to these animals? What was the cause of their demise? According to some, climate change caused the glaciers to fall, melt and fall on the megafauna. Well, not really. But climate change has been attributed uh, as one of the main causes for the extinction of the megafauna. Recently, a, a, the notion that a comet uh, struck the North American continent, causing the demise of many of these animals, has been proposed. Also, of course, the other major competing explanation is that people killed them all, or at least killed enough of them so that an ecological cascade happened that caused uh, the extinctions to reverberate throughout the ecosystem. Um, but one explanation is that humans bear the primary responsibility. Paleo Indian peoples were arriving in the continent at about the, si the same time the Pleistocene period was coming to an end. So pulling apart these two competing explanations, the arrival of humans with the climate change, is probably going to be difficult. And it probably means that something of both were, were to blame. This is a reconstruction um, based on archaeological evidence from north central Ohio of Paleo-Indian lifeways. These were, these earliest people in, in this hemisphere were migratory, they moved around a lot. Migratory is probably the wrong word, but highly mobile, following uh, the, the resources. They lived in an environment very different from the environment we think of today as Ohio. Many more open areas, lots more spruce trees than oak and hickory trees, although in some micro-environments there were probably oak and hickory trees as well. But because of the high mobility, um, because of the preserved toolkits that we have from the Paleolithic period, we think these people were perhaps primarily hunters, but also gathering whatever they could. This is the site in central Ohio where the Burning Tree Mastodon was uncovered here in Licking County, southern central Licking County, in the uh, deposits that are attributed to the Wisco late Wisconsin period. Zooming in a little bit, more than a little bit, this is the Burning Tree Golf Course. X marks the spot of the Mastodon site, which is right here in an existing pond. In 1989, when I first visited the site, there was no pond there. It was a fen, um, a very boggy area, one of those uh, sort of wet, grassy areas that you could jump up and down on. It would feel very spongy, almost like a little muted trampoline. And in fact, it appears to have been a kettle lake that had filled in over the millennia since the end of the Ice Age. And when I got there, the sort of damp wetland was being excavated to make a water hazard, which is in fact there on the golf course today. 
And in the process of that excavation, the guy operating the drag line discovered that it was filled with this rich peat deposit um, that they recognized would make a wonderful fertilizer. And they began to expand the hole to essentially mine the peat so they could find uh, fertilizer for the nine additional holes of the golf course. This uh, was a nine-hole golf course that was in the process of being expanded to an 18-hole golf course. And the name, of course, comes from the name of the golf course, the Burning Tree Golf Course. This is an aerial photograph that we took of the excavation. Uh, this would have been on the first day. Here's the drag line. This is the, the, the hole. Excavations had ceased and the hole had filled in with water. And this is a sort of frozen, a frozen pond. And this is the area where we, our excavation was confined. Here's a backhoe that you can see in there. Actually, there's an interesting anecdote in how this picture was taken. We had all the Columbus News channels come out. Channel 10, I believe, brought their uh, helicopter. And one of the times we were being interviewed, we were looking at the helicopter and said, wow, would it be great to get some aerial photographs of this? You know, could you take one of us up? And he looked at us and we were all covered in this black, mucky, you know, filth. And he was like backing away from us. Fortunately, uh, a colleague of mine had just shown up. And I said, him, can you take him? And he was perfectly clean. And they said, sure, we'll take him. So we put, what, six cameras around his neck. And they took him up and drove him around in the helicopter a little bit. And he managed to take these pictures, these with my camera. So we did get some nice aerial views of the excavation. This was my first look at the excavation, um, December 13th, 1989. The Ohio Historical Society had gotten a call <coughs> from the uh, Sherm Byers, the owner of the golf course, the day before when the discovery had been made. The drag line operator in the process of excavating this soft peat had hit something hard with a bucket. He wasn't expecting to find anything hard in this excavation and went down to look at it, cleaned it off, and uh, he told the news reporters that what he first thought he'd found was a prehistoric beehive, because what he was looking at at that point was the broken back of the, the skull, and it was uh, cancellous bone with lots of cavities, and it looked like a honeycomb. Um, this is the part of the skull he was looking at, but when he cleaned it off, he recognized it was a big bone, and then went to talk to Sherm, they got excited about it. Uh, as Sherman told me the story later, he, the first thing he did was call his lawyer to make sure that nobody could stop his excavation. When he was convinced of that, he called both the Ohio Historical Society, and at that time I was working at the Newark Earthworks Museum, so they asked me to go check it out. Um, when we often get calls that somebody's found a bone and they want us to come and look at it, and it's usually a cow bone or a horse bone, so that's what I was expecting. Sherm also called the local Licking County Archaeology and Landmark Society. And I've been working with the director, Paul Hogue, on a number of other projects. We talked to each other about this and agreed to go out together the next morning. That would have been the morning of the 13th. And about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, wind chill factors below zero. We go out there and you can see the steam coming off of this. And we looked and said, wow, that's no cow. That's not a horse. That's either a mammoth or a mastodon. Um, I couldn't tell which with my limited knowledge of paleontology because I couldn't see the teeth. The teeth are the most distinctive. Um, another shot of what I was looking at, there was already a rime of frost on, on the upper portions. And you can see there's a number of bones, the skull, you can see probably this is either part of the pelvis or one of the shoulder blades, one of the rear legs. We weren't sure. It looked like there was going to be a lot, but it was an odd kind of a assemblage. It wasn't simply a mastodon skeleton, uh, so I, I didn't know how complete it would be. Sherm was convinced already at this point that it was going to be a complete mastodon skeleton. Um, we said, this is great, can you fill it back in and, and we'll come back in the spring and, and dig it up. And Sherm said, no, uh, if you don't dig it up now, I will. And we looked at our watches and said, well, can you give us uh, a couple hours? And he said, okay, you got two hours. <laughs> and we left and it, I think we did quite an amazing job in about two hours and 20 minutes of getting a, a bunch of people together. We got the senior class of the Lincoln County Joint Vocational School donated to the, the project. We got uh, a burlap from a local feed mill, a bunch of boxes from a local moving company. We got a big flatbed truck from the Ohio Historical Society. And the Lincoln County School Board had just acquired the old tuberculosis sanitarium for, to become their new office building. At that point, none of those reservation renovations had taken place. 
um, but they gave us the laundry room to use as a temporary lab. Because in these cold temperatures, these bones were like sponges full of water. As they froze, it was going to do massive damage to the bones. So our first priority was to pull them out of the peat, wrap them up in, in a wet burlap, put them on the truck, and transport them to this facility where they could be uh, slowly uh, thawed and slowly dry, slowly dried. And we wanted to do a careful archaeological excavation, mapping everything in place, but there clearly wasn't time. Uh, Sherman Byers expected us to have this out in one day. Um, but we decided that this was, since this was in the middle of an ancient lake, this was probably a natural death. The animal perhaps had fallen through the ice, perhaps the animal had died on the ice and been scavenged, and when the ice melted, the bones had sunk down into the bog. So we doubted that people had anything to do with this. There was no direct evidence for people. Um, and so we proceeded to, on the assumption that we were salvaging a paleontological specimen. And so we didn't necessarily need all the care and caution we would normally take in an archaeological excavation. Nevertheless, we wanted to do as good a documentation as we could. So we exposed bones, photographed them in place, and then pulled them. Um, we did not have the opportunity to do that with this initial cluster of bones, because Sherman had taken us at our word, and after two hours, his crew removed all of the bones in this cluster. When we came back to the site with our crew, these bones were all up on the side of the excavation, and they had started working on an area where there were some more bones. Um, this shows, actually, uh, many people assume that mastodons are a kind of elephant, but in fact they are only distant cousins to elephants. Mammoths are elephants. Mastodons are quite unrelated. Their last common ancestor was 24 to 28 million years ago, uh, which means humans are more closely related to chimpanzees than mastodons are to elephants. And their teeth are quite distinctive. As I said, if I could have seen the teeth of that animal, I would have recognized the mastodon teeth, which look a lot like human molars with cusps, versus mammoth teeth, which look just like elephant teeth, plates of dentin stacked up next to each other with one surface sort of planed off from, from the grinding of the coarse vegetation. It was more likely that the, the animal would turn out to be a mastodon, because mastodons are much more abundant in Ohio. This Ohio Department of Natural Resources map shows that um, mastodons, which are the circles, are much more common than the mammoths, which um, See, I guess the mammoths would be, obviously there's no key here. Um, one of them is mastodons, which is the, probably the mastodons are triangles. I don't know. Um, this isn't going to look good on YouTube. Um, but mastodons are much more common than mammoths, probably 6 to 12 to 1 or something. There are mammoths in this environment, but overwhelmingly uh, the uh, fossils found here are mastodons, and although this looks like there's all kinds of them, many of these fossils are isolated teeth, a leg bone here or there, because at least one of these symbols is proboscidean, a leg bone, and you can't tell whether it's a mammoth or a mastodon. Um, if you saw mammoths and mastodons walking down the street, hopefully you could tell the difference. Um, mammoths would have been bigger, they were very high in the shoulder with a sloping back, long curving tusks, mastodons were shorter, straight backed, shorter tusks, um, they used their tusks, perhaps they were more utilitarian, and as we are right or left-handed, mastodons were right or left tusked. One tusk usually shows more wear than the other. So here's some various photographs from this flurry of, of activity over the two days. This is what we came back to, the pile of bones from that first cluster stacked up along the side. Um, this is the group from the Lincoln County Joint Vocational School, transporting the bones, we would map them in place, expose them, then pick them up and hand them to that crew. They'd wrap them up in wet burlap, take them up and put them up, load them onto the truck. Um, this is some of that happening with that initial cluster. And uh, here I am standing with Paul Hogue and, and Dick Livingston, who uh, was my boss for the Historical Society. This is the backhoe and this is the area where we were working. So again, our initial assumption that this was a natural death, we were simply salvaging a paleontological specimen, 
What was ironic was if we had had any time to reflect on what we were finding, there would have been alarm bells and red lights going off suggesting that this assumption was not tenable. But we only sort of put that together later in retrospect. Um, ideally, we would have been able to excavate this with more care and caution and thought, mapping things in carefully, and we would have a much better picture of what happened. As it is, we'll see what we think we found. This was bone cluster two. So when we got there, this was just beginning to be exposed. We took over. I stepped in the ditch with a trowel. Um, I remember Sherm looked glaring at me and saying, what are you going to do with that? You know, like, it was, you know, trowels were a very inappropriate tool. We were supposed to just yank these out. And I explained that at this point, I wanted to see if we could define a layer that the bones were occurring on. Um, which I was trying to do here, uh, where the, the peat was full of all kinds of other kinds of fossils. These are chunks of spruce wood, which we collected for later to use for radiocarbon dating. Um, but as it turns out, the spruce wood at this layer is much older than the bones themselves, which shouldn't have surprised me, because every time I stepped into the bog, I went, probably went back a couple thousand years too, because my foot sunk in up to my shin. But here you see the bones that comprise the second cluster. They were most of the ribs. And then here you see the heads of the vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, the vertebrae that the ribs attach to were also part of this cluster. And they were still articulated, hooked together as they had been in life, which indicated that muscle tissue, ligaments, were still holding this chunk of segment, segment of bones together when it became deposited at this point in the bone. And here, working on the third cluster, is myself with an unnamed volunteer who just jumped in and started helping us. We're here using rebar, big, uh, thin iron bars that were uh, an amazing tool because we could just run this down into the peat, and for the peat it would just slide through, but if it hit something hard, it was inevitably a bone, unless uh, we had a piece of wood, which did happen on a, on a couple of occasions, but for the most part, anything hard we hit was bone. So it allowed us to find very rapidly that the bones, in addition to the first cluster which had been taken out, and the second, all the bones were in three discrete areas with no bones in between, in the intervening areas. This is one of those things that should have been setting off bells in my head, but, but didn't, because it was furious activity all day that first day until dark, um, and then long after dark when we were taking care of the bones and sorting them at the... At the the laboratory facility. Then the next day, from dawn until after dark, when we completed the excavation, and then hours out uh, after dark, um, again processing the bones, putting them in the laboratory facility, and then for weeks afterwards attending to them. Um, I remember my wife was uh, such a saint during this time period. Our young son, our first son, had, had been born not too, not, not he wasn't that old. He was like a year old, I guess, and. I would come home exhausted, covered with complete muck all over my clothes. I took my like, clothes off in the garage. Later we had to like hose them off in the backyard before we could even bring them in the house. I came in exhausted. She put some food in front of me. She recorded all the news stories on, on, on VHS tape you know, while the was going on, so I was able to watch those later. Um, but then I went out and did the same thing and came back like hours, hours, hours after dark. Um, came back home exhausted and we went through the same process. So she was very supportive, recognized that, that what we were doing was not just fun and exciting, but important. So yeah, you can tell I'm, I'm happy, I'm smiling, I'm holding one of the bones. I'm not sure if that's uh, one of the front hand bones or perhaps a kneecap, but you can tell what day it is by the hat I'm wearing. This is the second day when I brought a warmer cap. Uh, in the, the, days, the first day's pictures, I'm like this guy wearing a baseball cap. And we later we enlisted the help of Dr. Dan Fisher, uh, probably the world's expert on mastodons from the University of Michigan. I uh, knew of him. I called him probably the second or maybe the, th the third day, I guess it was later, because I, I wanted to know how best to, to, to process the bones, to clean them. And he was very giving of his help and time. He told us not to use any brushes on them, to just rinse them with water. 
and then they had to be very carefully dried so they didn't develop cracks. He advised uh, certainly some of the bigger bones had to be flipped every few hours. So we had volunteer crews going to the, the Lincoln County Sanitarium at all hours of the day and night. I remember on some late shifts there, at two in the morning, flipping bones with somebody. And uh, it was interesting because there was a, a janitor there that apparently had worked there for a long time. And he kept telling us stories about, oh yeah, one of the patients had hung himself in that stairwell. You know, why are you telling me this at two in the morning when I'm hearing every little creepy sound in this place? But uh, it was a labor of love. It was almost like having a, a, a new kid. Uh, but Dan Fisher assembled this for us, uh, or in conjunction with us. We did it to, uh, sort of as a cooperative effort. Dan calls this his uh, roadkill diagram. It's as if the Mastodon got ran over by your Volkswagen or something and splayed out. But it shows all of the bones we found are colored in. The ones that have, uh, are in red, of course, are that first cluster, bone cluster two. The ones that are in blue are cluster two. This cluster one, cluster two, and then cluster three are the ones in green. Uh, cluster three was basically the two front limbs and uh, the neck vertebrae. Actually, those are the cervical vertebrae. Upside down, these are the thoracic vertebrae that the ribs attached to. Um, so, several meters apart, the two front limbs with the cer uh, cervical vertebrae upside down, the ribs with the thoracic vertebrae, and then somewhere else are the skull, the shoulder blades, the pelvis, and the left uh, femur at least, and then, then some of the foot bones. Now, Dan put this uh, diagram together, or Dan and I and Paul put the diagram together, based solely on the bones that could be identified from the photographs we took. The bones that are colored in brown are bones that are in the collection but don't appear in a particular photograph. Um, in some cases, <coughs> for example, the front hands, I know those were in the second cluster. But the reason they're not photographed is because as these, these bones, the front limbs were being excavated, <coughs> we were undercutting a wall and they were sort of going underneath it. On the other side of the wall was a deeper excavation filled with ice water and frozen over with ice. And as we were excavating the hands, water is like leaking in through the wall, and we were afraid at any moment that that, was, that dam was going to be breached and we would be flooded with ice water. So we didn't take time to take a lot of pictures at that point. But <coughs> I excavated both of these hands, the clusters of hand bones, with my rubber-gloved hands. And so I, I do know those for sure go with cluster two. And you'll notice, if you have very sharp eyes, that we're missing many of the fingers um, and many of the toes. We have a few of them. Um, and the absence of those toes should have been saying something to me. Because it's not like they were so tiny, you know, we missed them because we weren't screening the sediment. Mastodon toes are still pretty big. And I was excavating with my hands at this point, and the, the feet were fully articulated, and I'm pulling out each bone one after the other, another, and they're practically, you know, uh, adhering to each other almost. And when I got all of them out, I'm feeling around in that sediment and that muck, and there were no other hard objects there. So I didn't miss them, they just weren't there. Why wouldn't they be there? Well, that's an interesting question. And so the, the skeleton is remarkably complete. We're missing most of the right leg, except we have the right kneecap and we have the right foot. We're missing the left kneecap, a bunch of the toes. We're missing a few of the bones and the tail. Um, but mostly, it's, it's a very, very complete specimen. But why don't we have an entire leg? And this is Dan's map uh, based on the video and photography we took. Again, this only represents photographs that actually show up in a picture. And this uh, approximates the distances that we were able to calculate between the three clusters. And it shows quite clearly that there was nothing in the intermediate spaces. There were three distinct, discrete clusters of bones. And if they had anything to do with each other, these cervical vertebrae should be on the bottom of this skull. Now here's a cast of the Burning Tree Mastodon on display 
at the Kanagawa Prefectural Museum, and I'll mention that at the end too, because that's where the skeleton now resides. But this is the cast bones of the mastodon skeleton, all articulated, which, if this had uh, uh, been mastodon that had fallen into the muck and drowned and died there, because it, the, the bog, the fen, the, sh the shallow lake actually back then, was such a low energy environment, that's what we should have been excavating. It wasn't. We were excavating three discrete clusters of bones piled up, essentially. Now this, um, Dan Fisher actually came down, visited us, um, talked to Sherm, ended up taking several bones back with him to the lab. Among those were the tusks, because the tusks are very difficult to preserve. If they're, they're saturated with water, even rotating them, it's hard to preserve them from, from cracking because they're like trees, adding a new ring. And uh, because of those layers, if it dries, if it's just allowed to dry naturally, some of those outer layers dry first, crack, cracks open up to allow uh, water from inside the other layers to vent. Sometimes even those outer layers can spall off. Dan recommended, from his experience, to saw it in half longitudinally to let it dry slowly from the inside out, so to speak. There's very little deformation of the bone. And then later you can glue them back together, and they're just you know, very nice. A benefit of that is that you get this preserved cross-section and can count the rings of the, the, the tusk. Um, this shows one polished section of the inside of the tusk from the pulp cavity outward. And it shows there's alternating wide light bands, narrow dark bands, wide light bands, uh, narrow dark bands. The dark bands are winters when the animal isn't eating enough, is growing less. The wide bands are summer, spring, fall when there's a lot of growth. Um, and so these are not just yearly bands. Dan says if you look at them with a microscope, you can see fortnightly bands and actually actually determine the week the animal died. And this is the, the, the point at which the animal's death. It was growing from the pulp cavity out, and it died apparently in October of, well, whatever the radiocarbon dates that, that we have, which I'll show you later, because we, we got those later. So we knew at this point from, from Dan's knowledge of looking at it that it, was a, that it was a big male. It was, I think, 27 some years old, young, in his prime, um, we found out later he had a full belly, so he didn't die of starvation. So why did he die? Oh, in October, not the harshest weather time of the year. Um, there still would have been probably abundant food for him. Clearly there was, because his belly was filled. So not necessarily a time of year when you would expect a natural death. Once we started cleaning the bones, we started seeing marks on various bones. These are three consecutive ribs that uh, exhibit striations across them. This is a close-up of that top one. They're, they're jagged, um, not exactly uh, uh, smooth, um, but they don't look much like tooth marks in this. I've had some people think they, they might be tooth marks. Um, Dan's of the impression that they might have been made with some kind of coarse uh, flint chopping tool. Um, this is one of the few toe bones we have, and it's actually the ring finger from the left hand. <coughs> and you know, focus your attention to these marks, which are shown close up here. These are quite narrow, V-shaped, probably definite, probably definite. Um, they look, uh, they're very convincing as stone tool cut marks. And Dan's uh, reconstruction of the butcher technique is that a very sharp uh, knife was being used across the bottom of the palm to sever the tendons, and then the toes were used to help pull the hide off. And so the reason we don't have most of the toes is because they went with the hide. This is a scanning electron microscope photograph of one of those cut marks, and it shows all the classic characteristics of a stone tool cut mark. Uh, narrow, V-shaped in cross-section. Um, pretty direct evidence that this animal was butchered. Now when Dan was doing this inspection, um, he found other kinds of marks on other parts of the bone. These 
hundreds and hundreds of, of striations, most going in one direction, but, but some multiple uh, directions, he interprets as drag marks. So this was an exposed surface of bone that was dragged across a sandy or a gravelly surface. Now, in the, the, the bog environment, in this, this peat, there wasn't any sand and gravel to speak of. Um, so this is an indication that it died somewhere else and was transported to its present location. Now I said there was no sand or gravel in the bog. That's not strictly true. This is a, one of the epiphyses of the scapula, shoulder blade, and it was nooks and crannies were, were, were uh, sort of uh, abounded across the surf, inside surface of this that had filled in with peat. And since Dan didn't want us to scrub it clean, we rinsed it as much as we could, but in most of these cracks and crevices, a lot of peat was still there. As that dried, it peeled back, curled back, and as we pulled it back, in several places, there was sand and even some uh, fine gravel exposed in those cavities, which is an indication that when this animal died, there was gravel and sand around it. Um, the gravel and sand adhered to the bloody surface, was transported to the bog with the bone. It sank in there. The peat covered it. Later, when we brought it out, <clears throat> this was revealed. So forensic clues to the environment in which the animal died, which was not the place where we found it. This diorama at the Ohio Historical Society, made years before the mastodon discovery, seems to show exactly what happened at the site. Um, the animal was killed by people. We infer that. It could have been scavenged by people, but given that it was a young male, full belly, prime of his life, at a time of year, when winter was, you know, just beginning to be a, a, an issue, we can't imagine what natural causes might have contributed to the animal's death. Perhaps it was brought down by scavengers, but we don't have any marks of carnivores on the bones except for a very few marks that Dan interprets as canid, dog, or perhaps wolf, gnaw marks on a couple of the bones. If you've ever seen the film Nanook of the North, um, the Eskimos or the Inuit are, are butchering uh, Big, big mammal carcass, and their dogs are like rushing in and trying to nibble on bits and pieces. And you can sort of imagine that happening in this environment, the dog in the background also trying to get in and maybe gnaw on a couple of the bones. Uh, but the, the animal's being butchered. The kind of butchery that this guy's doing would have left the marks on the ribs that we found. Um, we're missing one of the leg bones. Perhaps one of the legs was busted open for a little feast of marrow at that uh, the time it was killed or the place it was killed. Later, once it had been butchered into appropriately sized chunks, it was dragged off and submerged on purpose into the shallow lake as a way, Dan thinks, of preserving the meat over the winter. Unfortunately, we did not find these stone spear points with the bones. We were not sifting any of the, uh, the, the peat, so it's possible there could have been things like this there. These were, however, collected by one of my students uh, that I was had at Denison at the time that went around to the local landowners looking at their collections from the fields surrounding the bog. And this is a surprising number of paleo and spear points to find in one field. Um, perhaps these could have been from the kill site. We don't know that for sure. This culture was around for several hundred years. It's possible these have nothing to do with the mastodon. But at least it's an interesting association of paleo Indian spear points of the appropriate period near the bog. But we have no smoking gun to say the animal was killed by these people. Um, we just have this forensic case that's built from the traces left at the, at the site. So, how did paleo Indians hunt mastodons? We know they did. There have been sites like the Kimswick site in uh, Missouri that, that show this. Paleo, Paleo Indians hunted mammoths in the, in the west. We find their spear points lodged in the ribs of these creatures. So did they use the direct approach? Um, get them stuck? Um, I've had uh, professors tell me that um, this is fanciful, but in fact mastodons and mammoths and modern elephants don't get stuck in, in lakes. This is where they go to sort of clean themselves, to enjoy, to lower their temperatures. Um, trucks get stuck in bogs. Elephants don't. 
And they also say that this kind of uh, direct hunting of mammoths would not have been a highly successful venture for the hunters that were attempted. So maybe they used an indirect approach. Well, that might not have been so successful. Um, why would paleontologists hunt mastodons and mammoths? From that earlier art artist's reconstruction, you see we think they lived in relatively small bands. Uh, mammoths and mastodons would have provided enormous packages of meat, probably packages of meat that a small band like that could not have utilized, even if they tried to dry the meat in the humid environment of Ohio, that meat probably, a lot of it would have gone bad before they could have possibly used it all. Um, so why would they risk themselves in an encounter with such an animal for the meat that they could use over the course of a few weeks feeding you know, a, a small group? Well, this notion that they could, in fact, preserve as much meat as they wanted in these shallow Ice Age lakes by killing the animal at the beginning of winter, planting, eating as much meat as you wanted, then planting the rest in the shallow lake, preserving it in a sort of Ice Age meat freezer. Um, this would, in fact, perhaps justify the effort because the long winter would be a, a rough time um, even in, in the, the, well, the Pleistocene or modern winters, maybe are a rough time for hunters and gatherers at this latitude in general. But if you could bring down a mammoth or a mastodon, but have its meat to last all winter during the hardest time of year for, for finding food, that might just make it worth it to, to, to take the risk to hunt such a beast. And that's exactly what Dan imagines that we have here, or, or what he's pieced together from the evidence for this. <clears throat> Would it work? Well, this is Dan Fisher with a draft animal that was owned by one of his colleagues at the University of Michigan. Her name was Mona. She died of natural causes, and her body was donated to science. Dan butchered the animal using stone tools, uh, separated the carcass into bits, and deposited it at various locations in shallow lakes in, in Michigan. And then would test the, the meat throughout the winter to determine whether it was edible. And basically his results showed that it's edible for a, at least a full year after it's been deposited in these lakes. He went back and checked frequently. This is Dr. John Sanger and students from Ohio Wesleyan University. John Sanger is a paleolimnologist, studies the ecology of ancient lakes. And he came out, this was uh, in the spring, so most of the, the, the ancient lake had already been excavated away by, by Sherman's drag line, but there were a few corners of the ancient lake preserved, and it was those corners that were, uh, John was going to take pollen cores. And then he looked at changing not just pollen, but all the kinds of preserved um, animals, fauna, microfauna that, that, that lived in the lake, to characterize the changing environments from the earliest formation of the lake to its final filling in. What we learned, I mean, not just from the pollen and stuff, but I mean, this is a picture of a leaf. I mean, we found bits of wood, logs from spruce, um, animal parts, insect parts, beetle parts, um, a few other mammal bones, pine cones, spruce cones, needles, moss. Um, a couple of these leaves, when we exposed them, were still green. And I tried desperately to get a picture of these, but we didn't have our cameras in the bog with them, or we'd have lost them. So we're working in the bog, working in this unit, in this muck, sinking you know, up past our ankles. The cameras are on the sides of the excavation. So as soon as I expose this, I said, oh, it's green, I've got to get a picture of this. You wade through the muck as fast as you can, take your gloves off, your hands are starting to freeze, you pick up the camera from over there, bring it over, open it up, it's already turned brown. I mean, that's how fast it happened. Took the picture anyway so that I could at least tell the story. Go put the camera away. My hands are completely numb by this time. Put the gloves back on and, and try and get back to work. Um, this is actually an important part of the story later. Um, so taking pictures, absolutely essential, um, but it was a very difficult and arduous part of what we were doing. Based on all this paleoenvironmental data that we got, much of it from the, the very layers that the mastodon bones were, 
found in. Um, the environment at the time the mastodon was living there was much like the spruce forest, much like cedar bog right here in Ohio. So a very different kind of environment from the one that's there today or that was there in historic times. Now this is the first day of the excavation. Um, Dr. Todd Frolking, a geologist from Dennison University, baseball cap, so you know it's the first day. This is, in fact, when I had my trowel out, and we were exposing some of the ribs here. After we had taken the ribs out, I had read of other mastodon excavations where they had found the gut contents. And almost invariably, this was a mass of chewed up spruce branches, all of pretty much the normal length. And this is why uh, people th thought mastodons ate mostly spruce. So that's what I was looking for. I said, well, this is where the chest cavity would have been. Let's look for the gut contents. And I'm trawling in this area and exposed a stripe of purplish brown, liver colored almost, um, material. It's about that long, about that wide, maybe as much as six inches, eight inches wide. And it was just, like I say, a stripe, maybe three feet, four feet long. And it smelled awful. And it was a very different consistency. It was sort of finer than the, the, the very dark brown, almost black peat that surrounded it. And it smelled like a sewer. And I said, Todd, Todd, come here and look at this. You know, what, what do you think this might be? And he kind of looked at it and said, well, who knows? It could be anything rotting away in here. And when I scooped up some of the trowel and stuck it under his nose, I said, well, smell it. And he said, oh, jeez, Charles. And he said, well, still, you know, who knows what it could be. It could be anything rotting here. And so then I'm, I'm holding it, this, this trowel with this gob of this stuff on it, looking down at it, looking over at my camera, and then I looked down on it, looked over at my camera again, and said, well, all right, we can't take a picture, we, it's too busy, I'm at least going to take some samples of this. And I took five or six Ziploc bags, filled up the sample, hastily with a Sharpie scrawled red-brown peat on, the, the, on them, sealed them up, set them on the side of the excavation, and we went back to work. At the end of the day, <clears throat> I uh, go back, I said, so where are those samples? And they were frozen solid. And I go, oh crap, well we take these back to the lab now, they're just going to thaw out and then get moldy before we can do anything with them. And Paul said, well I've got a freezer in my garage, you know, we can just stick it in there and keep them frozen. And I said, well, okay, that works. You know, your wife won't mind. You know, says, nah. So that was the plan. We took the samples. He took the samples off, put them in his fridge. Later, when John Sanger and his team are there, um, we took them on a tour of the facility, showed them the bones, and I was telling this story. And a guy sort of in the back uh, raised his hand and I said, yes. And uh, he said, well, if you think those are gut contents, have you looked for intestinal bacteria? I said, no, no, you have to understand, this is like 13,000 years old. There, there won't be any bacteria. And he said, well, I'm Dr. Jerry Goldstein, I'm a microbiologist, and yes, there could be. What did you do with the samples? I said, well, they froze and we kept them frozen. He said, perfect. If you'd done anything else, if they dried out, he wouldn't be able to check. And we said, oh, well, would you like to take a sample and, and check? He said, sure. So we gave him one of the bags, and he took them with him. And a week or so later, he called us. Um, oh, I got ahead of my story. You'll have to wait and find out what he, what he told us later. Um, it was interesting. <clears throat> Actually, can I get a pause and get a drink here again? I'm starting to lose my voice. Lemonade. Well, I'll just break. I was working right, at the ginger ale. There you see, though, what, what we found in what later proved to be gut contents. Ah, so you'll notice. No spruce at all in this material. There were naiad leaflets, moss, sedge, grass, pond, weed, water lily. And in the surrounding peat, there was some of the same stuff, but there was also spruce branches, twigs. Um, it was much coarser. So there was, it was really distinctive. So 
were very suspicious that this might be gut contents. <coughs> but, actually, let's see what slide I've got next. Ah, here's Jerry Goldstein. If you think this material is in Mastodon's guts, have you looked for intestinal bacteria? Called us back in a couple weeks. He had revived bacteria, Enterobacter cloaca. He said it's a species that only lives in animal intestines. And he revived these, this, these critters. They were alive. And for a time, these were listed in the Guinness Book of World's Record as the oldest living organisms on the planet. Uh, Jerry said it was like uh, parking your Volkswagen and coming back 11,000 years later and you know, putting gas in it and starting it up again. Um, in fact, later, the Center for Microbial Ecology at Michigan State University did a more comprehensive study of the gut contents and uh, the peat samples from the, that weren't guts found many species of bacteria, all of which only live in animal intestines, in the intestines, found other bacteria in the peat, but only bacteria that live in fresh water, not intestinal bacteria, making this a more or less conclusive case that, that these were gut contents. There's Jerry on the front page of the New York Times, uh, holding the picture of the, the bacteria. Um, we were actually one of the top 50 science discoveries of 1992, right there between homosexual brains and the 4,000-year-old man, mastodon <laughs> meals. So we, we changed people's ideas about what mastodons ate. Instead of spruce, they were eating a lot of what modern moose eat around Canadian lakes, what makes big mammals grow big and strong. Um, there isn't a lot of food value in spruce. So I wonder now if many of those other specimens that have been found with chewed up spruce branches in their guts were actually dying of starvation in winter and only eating the spruce just so they could put something in their stomachs. Oh, so changing uh, no, people's ideas about mastodon diets, reviving 13,000 year old bacteria, and also uh, the evidence of human butchery for uh, a mastodon in eastern North America. All of those things together made this one of the top 50 science discoveries of 1991. Here's the Michigan uh, Center for Microbial Ecology at the uh, Michigan State University's article, Identification of Bacterial Isolates Obtained from Intestinal Contents Associated with 12,000-Year-Old Mastodon Remains. Not only did they have the burning tree mastodon gut contents, but Dan Fisher had uh, recently excavated another Michigan mastodon uh, finding gut contents, and the same suites of bacteria were found in those gut contents. And that was the Heisler mastodon. Now, fast forward a few years. Um, I was reading an article in the paper, um, not this one. Um, a NASA researcher, Elena Picuda, had, uh, and her team had discovered bacteria in glacial ice. She's a NASA researcher that was, as I recall, 8,000 years old or something. And her research was if there was ancient life on Mars, and some of it was preserved in the glaciers, they could find it, uh, evidence by, by looking in the ice. Well, she was being greeted in the article that I was reading with a lot of skepticism. And I said, well, what's the problem with 8,000-year-old ice? We had 13,000-year-old bacteria. So I sent her an email, asked her if she was aware of this, and she said no, she hadn't been aware of this, and would I send the articles? I sent her the articles, and then she responded in another email, which Unfortunately, I don't seem to have saved, but it was, uh, it was quite amusing. She said, wow, some of those bacteria are so nasty, I can't grow them in my lab. Uh, did you have some kind of biohazard alert, you know, upon its discovery? And I'm like, um, no. <laughs> uh, I recall putting a trowel full of this under my friend's nose and asking him <laughs> to take a big whiff. Um, none of us have died. So... In retrospect, we should have handled that material with a little more discretion. Um, but now, uh, her team's got 32,000-year-old bacteria, and in fact, there's even much older bacteria that have been recovered from the guts of bees uh, preserved in amber. So the burning tree mastodon guts may have been some of the first to yield some of this ancient uh, life, but it's been done in, by much, uh, in, in much older context as well. This is a painting that Discover Magazine commissioned for the article uh, showing the burning tree mastodon in this rich spruce environment eating pond weed, water lily, swamp grasses instead of 
those luscious looking spruce trees in the background. And what happened to the burning tree mastodon? Well, in the United States, the, whoever owns the land owns the fossil specimen. Um, Sherm probably let us do whatever we wanted with the specimen for a couple of years. Any kind of destructive test, the radiocarbon dating that we did, that was fine. Um, but then he uh, sort of took it on the road, took it out to a fossil show in Arizona. Um, this is a New York, or a Wall Street Journal article from 1992 in April. Heading the list of, of fossils on the, the, the block were the Burnicky Mastodon, a complete 11,600 year old skeleton found in a bog in a golf course in Ohio. Um, uh, now its owner, Sherm Byers, wants to sell for $1.5 million. Um, he didn't get anybody to pay $1.5 million, as I understand. But from his stories, he apparently got a Japanese and a German museum in a bidding war and did get <coughs> a substantial sum of money for the skeleton. And it went to the Kanagawa Prefectural Museum um, in Yokohama. And this is another view of the display. These aren't the actual bones. The actual bones are in the reference collection for research. Um, these are the casts that Sherm also supplied as part of the deal. So did... Paleo-Indians drive mastodons and other Ice Age big game animals to extinction. I never thought my research would be in a position to contribute to that question. Um, but I actually think it does. I mean, it, it makes a, a reasonable context in which small groups of Paleo-Indians in the mid-continent would have a rationale for hunting mastodons. It wasn't simply sort of reckless macho behavior. It actually makes sense to hunt a mastodon at the end of, of the winter, or at the beginning of the winter, cache its meat over the long winter, have all of that meat available to you over the course of the winter. Um, one thing I don't think I had mentioned yet, and I'm not sure if, if I've got a slide coming up, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention this now. Um, the meat caching theory is very much Dan Fisher's theory. And I had to be dragged, kicking and screaming along with this, trying to be the skeptic, like, oh, that, that can't be. And I said, well, what about the gut contents? The first thing you do when you butcher an animal is gut it, because you don't want that source of bacteria there to contaminate the meat. And Dan said, well, that's really a good question. And he said, when, when, first of all, it wasn't all the guts. If it was all the guts, we would have had wheelbarrow loads full of this material. Um, it was just this small section. And when he was doing the experiments with, with Mona, he says, well, let's see what happens if we take a chunk of, of the intestines, tie off both ends, and leave it with the carcass. And, and what happened was quite extraordinary, and I don't know, and Dan doesn't know if this is actually what happened and, and why the, the stuff was put there, but it's a fascinating story because the process, the bacteria kept working, produced a lot of gases, and one end of this intestine blew up like a balloon and it bobbed up to the surface of the lake. Um, and it kept the water from freezing over that particular meat cache. Um, for all the other meat caches, when Dan was going out in the middle of the winter to sample them, you know, he had to take an ice pick or an ax and break the ice to, to, to get the sample of meat. When he went to that cache, he just had to move the balloon aside, you know, and reach down in and take the sample. So this chunk of intestine could have been put there on purpose to have been left as a marker for the, for the cache. And the fact that it somehow broke and then sank down into the bottom may be why this cache was never recovered. Um, maybe they couldn't find it again. Maybe they didn't have the, the iron tools necessary for breaking through the ice. Um, but sort of to get back to this scenario, the, the idea that Paleo-Indian Stone Age hunters could drive mammoths or mastodons to extinction always seemed to me a little incredible. But as this series of simulations shows, if the environment's deteriorating, but people aren't having an impact on, on, on our hunting, um, there may not be, um, well, let's see, the, the environment's deteriorating, but no hunting. Extinction happens, but it takes a long time. If the environment's not deteriorating, deteriorating, deteriorating and there's no hunting, there's fluctuations, but no extinction event. Um, but if there's deteriorating environment and hunting a very rapid extinction event. And it doesn't have to be hunting of that many animals. Um, 
if the, the animals are already suffering and humans are just taking out a few, uh, at least, at least in from, a, from a local population, that can be enough to tip the balance and to accelerate the extinction process. So these kinds of simulations, um, the fact that you can have a, a relatively small amount of hunting but contribute directly to the extinction, the fact that the meat caching hypothesis provides a context in which a small amount of hunting is rational for people at, 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 this, at this time, all suggest to me that, yes, people did, I think, have more of an impact on the extinction of the mammoths and mastodons than I had previously been willing to, to credit. And modern elephants have such a profound effect on their ecosystem, the extinction of the proboscideans could have had a cascading effect, causing a number of other extinctions, reverberating throughout this, this, this ecosystem, so that Paleo-Indians don't have to have been hunting all those animals that became extinct. They just had to be hunting a few, cause a few uh, uh, extinctions of these keystone species, and the whole arch could have essentially come tumbling down. So I think that's my last slide. Uh, they appear to be chasing a mastodon around with rocks and clubs at the Totally Natural Foods Cafe here in Licking County 13,000 years ago. All right. Um, we can turn the lights on and you can ask any questions.